Abandoned plane in Belgium. A plane sits abandoned in the middle of a Belgium forest. Photos of the small blue plane surfaced online, and many were quick to comment that it had tragically crashed through the trees. Although, at first glance, it does look like a crash site, that's not actually true. The plane is still quite intact, with the wings neatly detached and lying next to the body of the plane. If it crashed, it would have spread wreckage over a large area. Suddenly, the wings would have collided with trees and lie in broken pieces some distance from the fuselage. The Mayday Mayday plane is a 1940s Ryan Navion. The Ryan Navion was designed and built by North American Aviation. These planes are small, single-engine, light-fixed-winged aircraft. It was built to serve the post-war American market in 1948. It was envisioned that wartime pilots would want a recreational aircraft on their return to America to fly family and friends. Years later, they were also used by the United States Air Force. The plane did not crash, but it's actually a movie prop. It was brought here several years ago to film scenes in a short film. For some reason, the crew just left it there. 7. Swastika Forest In 1992, about 60 miles 90.65 kilometers outside of Berlin, in the small town of Uckermark, a landscaper found a group of large trees arranged in the shape of a swastika. Only visible from the air, the yellowing tree stood out prominently against the surrounding evergreens, to form the illegal and offensive symbol of the Nazis. The swastika was there for 60 years before it was finally discovered. A local forester named Klaus Gorik measured the trees and determined that they were first planted in the 1930s. That gave the trees decades to grow. The attention the site got was intense, and it was even reported by a US tabloid that the area was already viewed as racist and violent, and that the illegal symbols in the forest were not helping their reputation. In 1995, local foresters went straight to work to chop down over 40 offending trees. For nearly five years, the commotion around the trees subsided. However, in 2000, German newspapers published photos showing that the trees were growing back and showing the distinct yellow swastika once again. Twenty more trees were cut to the stump, leaving no evidence of the illegal symbol. They originally wanted to cut down all the trees, but were only given a small amount because the title of some of the belongings was in question. As a result, the proposed plan was blocked by the head of property management. It's been determined that the trees were planted during Hitler's peak during the 1930s, but no one knew who actually planted the trees. It was speculated that it was demanded by a Nazi leader that they be planted in honor of Adolf Hitler's birthday. And a local forester stated that when he was a child, he planted the trees, and a forester paid him a few cents per seedling. Uckermark wasn't the only village that sported trees forming a swastika. Trees just like it were discovered in Kyrgyzstan near the Himalayas. It was believed that these trees were arranged by German prisoners of war who'd hoped to evade their Soviet captors. The swastika can still be seen in images of the stumps, and it was only in the last 10 years that neo-Nazis trampled the symbol into a cornfield. 6. The Devil's Tramping Ground The Devil's Tramping Ground is a campground in the woodlands near Harper's Crossroads in Bear Creek, North Carolina. It's full of popular mythology and traditions about the devil haunting and tramping an empty 40-foot, 12-meter circular patch. Nothing grows in the circle, and animals refuse to cross it. Locals and nearby communities are well aware of the stories. According to witnesses, whatever is left in the circle disappears so that the devil has space to dance. According to a local journalist in the region, during the darkest nights, the majesty of the underworld of evil wanders quietly around the ring, scheming and conspiring against good. The journalist spent the night in a tent in the middle of the circle with his dogs in an attempt to debunk the story. He lasted till the next morning and reported that he heard ghostly footsteps circling him throughout the night. Aside from the devil story, there have been a few other stories told surrounding the bizarre spot. Some assume the site was a gathering spot for local Native American tribes who formed the barren ring during ceremonial dances. A different theory connects the circle to the lost colony of Reniaki Island. The story is told that the tramping ground was originally called Croatan, named after a fallen tribal chief who died there after a battle.
Scientific explanations for the characteristics of the Devil's Tramping Ground have also been offered. Some believed horses, used in the operations of an old molasses mill, created the spot with their constant circular treading. However, when the spot was compared to the paths formed at similar mills, it didn't support this theory. All of this raises the question of whether the circle represents the devil, the territory of some nocturnal creature, or if the responsibility of frightening people has simply been passed down from generation to generation by locals. 5. Abandoned Fairy Village Tucked away in a forest, the crumbling ruins of a fairy village can be found at the end of a service road in Connecticut, overlooking a major interstate highway. It's known as the Little People Village of Waterbury, Connecticut, and has been forgotten by most. A stone cliff with tiny houses carved into it and a massive throne can also be found on the property. Plants and flowers have overgrown their beds, and both the gardens and fairy houses have integrated into the forest, leaving evidence of an exuberant garden that was once planted there. Many local myths have surfaced regarding the origins of the tiny houses. According to legend, a woman from the nearby town of Middlesbury went insane and claimed she was being plagued by little fairies. She insisted that her husband build them a village so they could live far away from her and leave her alone. Another theory is that a man named William heard fairy voices demanding him to build them a village. He obliged, yet they still continued to torture him so badly that he ended up taking his own life. Locals claim that if you head to the village on a full moon night, you can hear the fairies laughing, proud of the tricks that they played on William. Residents argue that the most likely explanation is that the miniature village was merely a roadside tourist attraction. It's right next to the main road, which used to be a trolley line. The attraction was sought out during its time, but was quickly forgotten when the major highway was built. If you ever want to visit the village, beware, it doesn't come easy. The area cannot be accessed by car, and the road that sits at the end of the forest does not allow parking. It's not illegal or restricted, but the city makes it difficult to avoid vandalism or misuse. Do you believe in fairies? Tell us in the comments and hit subscribe while you're at it. 4. The Stony Point Railroad Midgetville, which is probably known as the Stony Point Railroad, is a tiny town in Virginia that was built in the yard of a retired coal miner named Sam Johnson. Sam developed the town in 1996 and has been improving it ever since. Midgetville is composed of scraps and leftover materials and features 1,700 feet, 518 meters of track, with a working railway car, a jail, postal service, bookstore, salt pump, and all that of a fully operational town. The locomotive, made from scrap metal, is powered by a 1967 Chevy truck engine, with rotors serving as locomotive wheels. Midgetville offers several odd attractions. Strange sculptures scatter the town, bicycle wheels whirling, a camel proudly standing on a pedestal, art that doesn't waste a single bit of trash. Sam's interest, aside from trains, are in history, and a ride along the track will uncover elements of his family tree and the past of the area too. If Sam, his wife, or his dog were around, they would gladly give you a tour. But sadly, the Stony Point Railroad is now permanently closed. 3. The Thing in the Woods In 1962, in the dense forest of Moncton, New Brunswick, David McPherson Sr. discovered a mysterious 400-pound, 181-kilogram white box attached to a parachute adorned with some very large lenses. For the next 55 years, the box became known as The Thing in the Woods. McPherson and some friends plowed the forest to make a path and brought the box back to his property near Moncton. McPherson's initial assumption was that the box may have belonged to an American spy company, perhaps dropped by the CIA. When word of the discovery got out, the Canadian military attempted to confiscate the box from him, which cemented his theories about what was inside. Neighbors from all over came to see the mysterious box, and one woman claimed that the box was ticking and would blow up a mountain at any minute. While McPherson was at work, the Canadian military showed up at his house in an attempt to retrieve the box. However, his wife Lewis was not gonna let that happen. After six men pulled up to the property in a large truck and tried to carry the box away, Lewis snapped. 
after a few words, it was stated that the corporal was enraged, and they left. After they left, Lewis decided to open the box. Inside, she found two cameras and roughly 12 bottles of clear liquid. Writing was also found on the equipment, but it wasn't in English, so she had no idea what it said. McPherson never found out that his wife opened the box, and the next day, the Canadian military arrived once again. They promised the family they could be there when the box was opened, but after it was loaded up and hauled away, they never saw the box or heard from the military again, even though they requested information from the Department of Defense twice. David McPherson Sr. passed away roughly seven years ago, with the box still remaining a mystery. His son reported in July 2017 that his dad's assumptions were right from the beginning. It was revealed by declassified documents that the mystery box belonged to a CIA program that sends cameras into the sky via balloons in order to spy on the Soviets. 2. Mummified Dog Loggers typically anticipate ordinary things like a bird's nest or a squirrel while harvesting trees, but the last thing they expect to find is a mummified dog in the core of a tree. A logging crew from Rome, Georgia was cutting down trees for pulpwood in southern Georgia in 1980. One of the employees saw something sticking out from the top of a tree trunk while loading the wood. Inside, he discovered what appeared to be the remains of a magnificently mummified dog. The tree was taken to experts, who discovered that the dog, accordingly named Stucky, had been a hunting dog in the 1960s. It's believed that the canine likely chased an animal such as a squirrel or a raccoon into a hole in the root and got trapped. The more he climbed, the more narrow his space became, remaining stuck at 28 feet, 8.5 meters. The tree, along with Stucky, was gifted to Southern Forest World, a tree forest located in Waycross, Georgia. Museum staff believe the dog's body mummified due to an upward draft through the hollow tree which created a chimney effect that carried away the scent of the dead animal. The tree also provided dry conditions, whilst the oak's tannic acid, a natural substance that absorbs moisture, helped harden the dog's skin. 1. New England Stone Chambers The stone walls found across the New York, England states have doubled in 90 years, reaching nearly 500 miles (804 kilometers). Since the 1930s, there's been long-lasting speculation about how hundreds of stone walls got where they are, their age, and the cultural significance behind them. They're very unique, and also called beehives, caves, huts, and root cellars. They are distinguished by their expert construction with fitted masonry stone and massive stone slabs. Beehive stone chambers were the most lavish of the bunch, with its cone form, smoke holes for ventilation, and built-in seats and shelves. The chambers are surrounded by intriguing landscape, including pedestal boulders, balancing rocks, enclosures, ceremonial walls, and standing stones. The stone structures seem to be reserved for the New England area, as they've been found nowhere else in North America. Roughly 800 chambers are spread throughout all states. Typically, they are circular or rectangular in form, and can be anywhere from 15 feet 4.5 meters to 30 feet 9 meters long and 10 feet 3 meters wide with the central chamber averaging 10 feet 3 meters tall over the past few decades the majority of archaeologists and historians have thought that colonists built the chambers evidence of ancient etchings in the form of ogam script dating from 1000 bc to 300 bc have been uncovered by a professor at harvard the etchings are believed to have been carved in stone by Celts from the Iberian Peninsula, located in what is today's Spain and Portugal. He argues that beehive-shaped stone chambers resemble ancient cells constructed by Irish monks. Other proof offered by those who believe in an early European colony include stone circles, carved deities, and animal images, symbolic symbols, and Celtic place names. The discussion centers on the two competing ideas of historic or ancient origin. Early reports of New England colonists recall stone chambers that existed before they inhabited the country, as well as unusual Indian forts. It also fails to explain how trees that predated settlement could sometimes be used to verify the age of the chamber, how passages were frequently too low and small to pull a card through, and how the rooms had earth floors that would rot crops. 
The Stone Age sweat lodges are believed to have been built by Native Americans before the first Europeans made their appearance. There is no archaeological evidence to support such a claim, and it's not known that Native Americans lived in this area at the time of its construction. Researchers today strongly disagree with that notion and stand by their belief that they were in fact built by Native Americans or their ancient ancestors. Number 10. The USS Independence The USS Independence was an aircraft carrier that served in the Pacific Ocean during the early 1940s. While World War II raged all over the globe, it was a vital base for many fighter planes employed by the US military. The USS Independence survived the war in one piece, but met its final fate a few years later. It wasn't destroyed in conflict, though. Instead, the massive ship was given a different assignment. It was involved in the atomic bomb tests in Bikini Atoll. The Independence ended up being used as a target for nuclear blasts so that scientists and military officials could learn more about the devastating effects of atomic bombs. Photos of the ship from that time show it battered and buckled by a deadly combination of shockwaves, heat, and radiation, which slowly chipped away at her as she performed her valiant role as a guinea pig for the nation she once defended. There's only so much a ship can take when faced with detonation after detonation. Noticing the rate at which the USS Independence was falling apart, officials made the decision to scuttle her, deliberately sinking her off the Farallon Islands. Surveys of the area 64 years later revealed the final resting place of the warship. The ship is in surprisingly good condition, resting slightly on her side at 2,600 feet below the surface, and still in one piece despite the damage she sustained. However, no attempts will be made to rescue her. Instead of the fighter planes she was used to carrying, she was loaded with radioactive waste material from the tests. Number 9. The Basilic In the medieval world, the city of Constantinople stood tall. Considered the doorway to Europe, it was an impenetrable fortress with layers of thick walls and a well-defended coastline. Many rulers wanted to conquer it, but they all failed. However, one man was so hellbent on taking the famous city that he commissioned the building of the largest cannon ever seen, the Basilic. The man's name was Sultan Mehmed II, who went on to become one of the greatest rulers in the entire history of the Ottoman Empire. The Basilic was built by the famous gunsmith Urban and was an absolute monster of a weapon. It measured 27 feet in length and could house a 1,200-pound stone cannonball in its 30-inch diameter chamber. It was crafted out of bronze that was 8 inches thick and weighed a massive 40,000 pounds, which meant that it needed countless oxen in order to haul it into position. When the Basilic was fired, the sound thundered over a distance of 10 miles, and that 1,200-pound cannonball we spoke of could be propelled over a mile. Battlefields could be noisy places, but Basilic made it literally deafening. For the people of Constantinople in 1453, it would have been a terrifying thing to behold due to a combination of its size, sound, and destructive power. However, medieval cannons did have their drawbacks, and Basilic was no exception. It would take hours in order to set it up to be able to fire, with agonizing relocating, aiming, and loading needing to take place for every shot, and early cannons were far from reliable. Despite being secured in mud in order to absorb most of the enormous recoil generated by it, the bronze metal of the Basilic began to show signs that it was cracking quite soon after beginning to fire. Eventually, the damage took its toll, and like many other cannons of the time, it exploded, causing damage to the Ottoman troops and rendering it completely useless. However, it is thanks to artillery like the Basilic that Sultan Mehmed II was able to take Constantinople and change the game when it came to siege warfare in the Western world. Number 8. The Paris Gun You may have heard about Big Bertha, the German howitzer of World War I that struck fear into many of the Allied forces. However, you'd be more unlikely to know about the Paris Gun, and there's a good reason why it's faded into the history books. The Paris gun was a strange contraption with a metal base at one end into which stairs were installed so that artillerymen could get to the barrel of the beast and operate it. At the other end was a massive tubular chamber measuring 69 feet long, supported by metal struts and scaffolds similar to that used on steel bridges. Construction of the gun was completed in early 1918 and it was used between March and August of that same year. But why was it so huge? The answer to that partly lies in its name of the Paris gun. Thanks to its unique design, it was able to propel large 233-pound shells over a distance of 74 miles, allowing the Germans to rain destruction on the city of Paris from far away in the forest of Saint-Gobain. However, its massive range had its setbacks. Despite being able to fire around every 15 minutes, the accuracy of the shots wasn't great. 
As a result, over the entire period in which the Paris gun was shelling the city it was named after, only 256 people were killed, with 620 being injured. This remarkable feat of engineering was ultimately pretty useless. The only records we have of the Paris gun come from photographs taken from the time. When the tides of the war started to turn and the German forces realized they were on the brink of defeat, they destroyed it to save it from falling into enemy hands. Number 7. The V3 Cannon During World War II, Hitler commissioned the development of revenge weapons, or Vergeltungswaffen. The first two of these, called V1 and V2, had been responsible for causing destruction and terror across England. They were pilotless missiles, and the V2 was even capable of breaking the sound barrier. V3 was a little bit different, and in fact is much more like the Paris gun already featured on this list. In fact, the Paris gun was where the inspiration for this war machine came from. Also known as Project High Pressure Pump, construction and planning began in August of 1942. The man at the head of the project was August Coindes, a machine gun engineer who had been inspired by the French documents on the Paris gun and their attempts to create a counterweapon. The aim was to create 50 of these guns in an underground bunker just outside the small French village of Mimoyek. The intention was that they would be able to fire around every five minutes, meaning that 600 shells would come plummeting down on the city of London each and every hour of the day. It's truly a frightening thing to think about, given the fact that the city was also being heavily bombed by planes and zeppelins at the time. However, V3 was destroyed before it could fire a single shell. The Germans didn't do a good job of hiding the encampment where the weapon was, as they left out hay bales to disguise the gun turrets. This would have worked great at first, but as the local farmers started to bring in their bales, it looked mightily suspicious to the Allied troops, with the RAF's Lancaster bombers eventually destroying the site with the specially designed Tall Boy Bomb. Number 6. The Surcouf Surcouf was a French vessel that was completed in 1935. She was the world's biggest submerged submarine, weighing 3,404 tons with a length of 350 feet and a beam of more than 29 feet. She could also travel around the world with ease. Surcouf had a range of 10,000 nautical miles and a crew of 120 men. She wasn't lacking firepower either, with a twin turret containing 8-inch guns. Surcouf even had a waterproof hangar on it from which a seaplane could be launched for reconnaissance. Among other tricks up her sleeve was a 16-foot-long motorboat and a prison capable of housing 50 inmates. When World War II started, many questioned the loyalty of the crew of the Surcouf, but she was given refuge in the UK port of Plymouth, along with the men who decided to stay with her and fight in the Free French Army. Eventually, she was sent out on patrol around the Atlantic and Pacific. However, thanks to her unreliability and some of the questionable decisions of her crew, such as seeming to attack an Allied merchant ship, the Surcouf was described as being of no operational value and is little short of a menace by a British admiral. The Surcouf made her final voyage from the port of Bermuda on the 12th of February, 1942. However, she was never seen again. Was she a victim of enemy ships or the Bermuda Triangle itself? Let us know what you think happened to the Surcouf in the comments below and hit subscribe while you're at it. Number 5. The XB-70 Valkyrie The XB-70 Valkyrie was the quickest and the largest bomber ever developed by the U.S. Unfortunately, the gigantic six-engine Mach 3 capable plane was never fully commissioned. They did, however, build two prototypes. The theory was that if the planes could fly high enough and fast enough, they would be unable to be stopped by anti-aircraft missiles and enemy fighter planes so they could complete their objective unharmed. Development started in the 1950s, and by 1964, the two planes were completed. They measured 185 feet in length and had a wingspan of 105 feet and could fly at over 2,000 miles per hour. Sadly, just two years later, in 1966, one of the prototypes was involved in a mid-air collision with its escort plane while in the middle of testing. Two pilots died as a result, and another was seriously injured in the crash. The XB-70 was completely destroyed. The project was scrapped in 1969, and the surviving prototype now makes its home in a museum in Dayton, Ohio. Number 4. The Moxva The Moxva was seen as the Russian flagship of the Black Sea. The guided missile cruiser was initially known as the Slava when she was initially built in 1976. She measured 611 feet in length, weighing over 9,000 tons and carrying a crew of over 400 men. It was deployed in many missions, but its most notable and last mission was in 2022 when it was used in the war against Ukraine. During this conflict, it was struck with anti-ship missiles by Ukrainian forces working in tandem with their allies and was sunk. It's unknown how many people died on board. There's been much debate on whether the Moxva was actually gunned down by enemy forces. Russian state media and the defense ministry instead claimed that the ship suffered a fire on board, which caused ammunition to explode and cause it to sink beneath the waves.
Others see this as a sign that the country wished to keep its losses a secret so as not to panic its countrymen and women. The sinking of the Moxva makes it the largest warship to sink in over 40 years. The last one, the ARA Belgrano, sank during the 1982 Falklands War. Number 3. The Panzer VIII Mouse The word mouse means mouse in English. However, this next war machine is far from small and is in fact the heaviest tank ever made. The brainchild of Ferdinand Porsche, the founder of the Porsche car brand at the command of Hitler, the mouse tank weighed in at over 180 tons. To put this into perspective, a modern M1A1 Abrams MBT tank weighs only 67 tons, and another tank at the time, the Tiger I, weighed only 50 tons. This was in part due to the fact that its armor was up to 9 inches thick. No wonder it had a max speed of 10 miles per hour. Of course, mobility was an issue, especially when it came to crossing bridges. Mouse would simply be too heavy for them. So the logical conclusion of the German engineers was that instead of going over bridges, it would go under them, and was designed to be able to drive underwater. Just before it was able to be brought into production, the factory in Essen charged with manufacturing these colossal tanks was bombed and destroyed by Allied bombers. This meant there were only two prototypes left of the tank one of which was blown up by the Germans themselves to stop it from falling into enemy hands, and the other captured by Russian forces. Funnily enough, the Russians found the tank to be completely useless. And so the last surviving mouse tank sits in the Kubinka Tank Museum to this day. Number 2. War Wolf War Wolf was a trebuchet, a wooden contraption designed to fling materials and projectiles with speed and force, and a popular choice of weapon for medieval sieges. Warwolf puts all other trebuchets to shame. The English and the Scots had been consistently fighting on and off for a number of centuries by the time our story begins in 1304. And in fact, they would continue for many years to come. King Edward I of England was doing particularly well in his war with Scotland, and their defense had been sapped down to just one fortress left standing, Stirling Castle. And Edward has the perfect weapon. Warwolf was the trebuchet of all trebuchets. It measured in at over 300 feet tall when fully extended and was able to hurl stones weighing over 300 pounds. It had to be carried in over 30 wagons and had a force so powerful that Edward even ordered the lead stripped from nearby churches in order to make counterweights for it. Initially, Stirling Castle refused to surrender. However, after three long months of watching War Wolf being assembled right outside their gates, they started to feel rightfully nervous. We can only imagine what must have been going through their minds as it started to take shape. When it became obvious just what sort of monster Edward had created, the garrison tried to surrender. But Edward was having none of it. He was going to have a bit of fun with his new toys. The castle walls and gates were obliterated within a few throws. The original war wolf has been lost to time, likely because it was too cumbersome to take around everywhere. However, a replica can be seen outside nearby Kerlavrock Castle. Number 1. The Helepolis the year is 305 BC. Demetrius I of Macedonia has been sent by his father, King Antigonus, to besiege the island city of Rhodes, located just off the Greek mainland. Demetrius's eventually doomed campaign led to the creation of one of the most bizarre war machines ever created, and one of the largest. Named Helepolis, or Taker of Cities, it was the largest siege tower that the world had ever seen. It was a staggering 130 feet tall and 65 feet wide. Primarily made of wood, it was reinforced with iron plating that was lined with animal skins and wool to make it fireproof, with shutters at the front which could be opened for the Macedonians to fight from. Sounding more like an apartment building than a weapon of war, it had nine floors and could house hundreds of men who would operate the cannons and ballistae that were stationed inside. But something so huge was not without its flaws. The 160-ton tower took 3,400 men to move into position, working in shifts due to the heavy exertion it took to move the thing. The people of Rhodes were not going to let Demetrius and his behemoth of a structure intimidate them. They savagely attacked back, ripping away the iron plating to expose the vulnerable wood underneath and even soaked the ground underneath it so that the Helepolis became mired in the mud. Sensing that the battle was not going to go in his favor, Demetrius and the Macedonians retreated, leaving much of the equipment and their siege weapons behind. The Helepolis was inevitably destroyed. However, there's a very famous testament to its legacy. The Rhodians were able to gain a lot of wealth from scrapping, melting down, and selling many of the leftovers from Demetrius's failed campaign, including Helepolis. Using the funds and raw materials, they built the Colossus of Rhodes, a huge statue straddling either side of the port in honor of the sun god Helios. Sadly, this also fell to ruin as the result of an earthquake, but it lives on as the inspiration for the Statue of Liberty and the Titan Statue of Bravos in the series Game of Thrones. Number 10. Basnes Car Cemetery 
Deep in the forest of Sweden's Varmland region near the Norwegian border, there's a car cemetery filled with hundreds of vehicles dating back to the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. They've been here for so long that many of them are covered in moss and even have trees growing through them. The cars are stacked on top of each other and parked side by side at the well-hidden property known as the Basnes Car Cemetery. Legend claims that many of the vehicles were left behind by American soldiers when they returned to the US at the end of World War II, but the rumor has never been verified. Word also has it that the graveyard is owned by two reclusive brothers who interact minimally with visitors and avoid the spotlight, but they live nearby and keep an eye on the property. Past sightseers claimed that the owners once left a note scrolled across several car seat covers, stating that it's fine for people to look around to take pictures, but not to take anything or leave the site looking any different than they found it. The message noted that there had been at least 30 burglaries at the car cemetery so far that year and that the owners were fed up with the repeated crimes. They gave a stern warning that they had set traps inside some buildings on the land and that they didn't care if someone got hurt or died. The note also reportedly contained a warning to remember that the visitors were in a secluded place where nobody could hear them scream. No one knows whether these stories are actually true or if perhaps they're exaggerated or the product of local folklore, but many photographers, artists, and curious explorers continue to take their risks by visiting, and there are no known reports of anything bad happening to anyone. Number 9. Heaven Can Wait B-24 Bomber in 1944, during World War II, U.S. Army Air Corps Second Lieutenant Thomas V. Kelly Jr. was sent on a mission to disrupt Japanese supply chains in 1944. The B-24 bomber he was flying in, nicknamed Heaven Can Wait, was shot down over Papua New Guinea, and the aircraft, along with the 11 crew members on board, remained missing for over 70 years. When Kelly's family realized that he probably wasn't coming home, they had a tombstone made in his memory. In 2013, some of his surviving relatives found information online about the plane he was shot down in. In. They spent several years conducting further research, which finally paid off when experts searched the ocean floor in 2017 in hopes of finding the bomber. The team located Heaven Can Wait in Hansa Bay. After sitting more than 200 feet underwater for decades, the wreck is heavily deteriorated and in extremely poor condition. While the remains of Kelly and his fellow crew members remain officially unaccounted for, the discovery brought long-awaited closure to their families, who now have a much clearer picture of what happened that fateful day. Number 8. Bagger 258 and Bagger 1473 Nicknamed the Blue Wonder, Bagger 258 is a massive bucket wheel excavator that went into operation in Soviet-controlled East Germany in 1964 as a coal mining machine. Today, it sits abandoned on a field in the municipality of Skipkow, measuring nearly 563 feet long and 164 feet high. The gargantuan vehicle was like a mobile factory. Equipped with tank-like tracks, it moved at a painfully slow speed of less than 20 feet per minute. The colossal contraption's 10 blades dug 49 feet into the ground, collecting huge buckets full of coal and soil. Some of the coal was mechanically sifted and diverted to feed the machine's engine, but Bagger 258 was abandoned in 2002 when there was nothing left to mine. It was easier and cheaper to leave it behind than to dismantle or relocate it. Skip Cow is home to another abandoned excavator known as Bagger 1470 which is often mistaken for Bagger 258. It operated from 1965 to 2002. After it was taken out of service, local municipalities agreed to preserve it and designated it as a monument to the area's mining history. But Bagger 1473 proved expensive to maintain. It deteriorated rapidly and became a popular target for vandalism. In 2019, the same municipalities that voted to preserve the excavator announced plans to scrap it. In a bid to stop this from happening, state archaeologists and officials quickly moved to have the machine declared historically significant. For now, Bagger 1473 continues to rot as authorities try to figure out how to preserve it and who will pay for it. Number 7. Miles of Locomotives in 2017, news reports revealed that there were around 300 unused Union Pacific locomotives collecting dust along some railroad tracks near Interstate 10 between Benson and Tucson, Arizona. Many people had noticed the freight cars, which sat neatly lined up for three miles and were curious about why they were there. Fox 10 Phoenix looked into the matter and caught up with Jeff DeGraff, the company's director of media relations. He described the collection of locomotives as a strategic reserve that had been set aside because they were no longer needed during a manufacturing slowdown in the US. In other words, the cars are placed in storage in Arizona, where the dry conditions tend to cause less wear and tear while they waited to be put back into use. Speaking with the new station, DeGraff explained
explained that the arid climate meant that the company didn't have to worry too much about rust and other weather and climate related damage. He made it clear that the engines, which were valued between $1 million and $3 million each, weren't permanently abandoned and that they were moved in and out as needed. In the meantime, Union Pacific employees monitored and maintained the cars to ensure that they were ready to return to the railroad. Number 6. The Fugitive Trainwreck the 1993 movie The Fugitive, starring Harrison Ford and Tommy Lee Jones, contains a famous scene where a freight train crashes into the main character Richard Kimball's transport bus. If you've seen the movie and notice that the collision seems incredibly realistic, there's a reason for it. And it's not because of CGI effects and advanced imaging technologies, which had not yet become standard in the movie industry. Back then, the best way to capture lifelike effects on camera was to film the real deal. The scene was shot on tracks belonging to North Carolina's Great Smoky Mountain Railway in the town of Dillsborough, where the filmmakers placed the bus on a purpose-built spur and crashed a hollowed-out train into it. Because they only had one shot at getting the crash right, the crew captured it using a lot more cameras than shooting a movie scene normally requires. For some added excitement, they loaded some PVC pipes with explosives and buried them beneath the track. Writing for TheSmokies.com, journalist John Gillian described the effect as every five-year-old playing with Hot Wheels' dream come to life. He further explained that the railway asked the film crew to leave behind the wrecked vehicles as a tourist attraction. The crew agreed and left the train and banged up bus, which was nearly torn in half in the crash. They sit on private property owned by the Great Smoky Mountain Railway. Those who wish to see the vehicles can catch a glimpse of them from a passing train on the Tuckasegee River excursion, but the train doesn't stop, so exploring the vehicles up close is not an option. Have you seen the movie The Fugitive? Tell us in the comments and hit subscribe while you're at it. Number 5. FDR's Train for decades, rumors have swirled about a hidden 1930s-era train station beneath Grand Central Terminal in New York City. Known simply as Track 61, it reportedly contains a single track. It was built specifically for then-President Franklin Delano Roosevelt (FDR), who didn't want people to know that he had polio and needed a way to come and go without being spotted by the public. The native New Yorker was likely worried that if society knew about his polio, it would weaken his image due to the widespread stigma surrounding the disease at the time. Roosevelt arrived on Track 61 in a specially designed armored train car that carried his limousine. From there, the limo was driven off the train and into a huge elevator that carried FDR and his entourage up to the historic Waldorf Astoria Hotel's ballroom. Track 61 went out of use when Roosevelt passed away in 1945. Until recently, a deteriorating rail car sat on the track amid widespread claims that it was the train that transported FDR in and out of the station. The Danbury Railway Museum in Connecticut now owns the car. Upon taking a closer look, experts revealed that it didn't belong to Roosevelt and that he probably never rode in it. Known as a baggage car or tool car, it was used for much less exciting everyday purposes. The interior consists of an aging wooden floor, hooks for hanging tools, and a generator. While the true story about the car is far less fascinating than many would like to think, it's one of few known remaining cars of its type from the time, which makes it fascinating in its own right. Number 4. Boeing B-17E Swamp Ghost in early 1942, the Japanese Imperial Navy seized an Australian military base at Rabaul in Papua New Guinea. The US military dispatched six Boeing B-17E Flying Fortress heavy bombers from Honolulu with plans to strike the invading fleet. One of the planes was piloted by Captain Fred Eaton. During his first run over the target, the aircraft's bomb bay doors got stuck. It was subsequently swarmed by enemy bombers while anti-aircraft fire struck a wing fuel tank. Eaton piloted the plane toward Port Moresby on the other side of the island. But but he ran out of fuel along the way and decided to land in what looked like a large open field. It turned out to be the Agaimbo Swamp. Thankfully, Eaton and his fellow crew members survived, but their trek out of the remote crash site was nothing short of grueling. For 64 years, the downed aircraft sat in five feet of thick grass and swamp water, earning it the nickname Swamp Ghost. A crew led by aviation enthusiast Alfred Hagen finally removed it in 2006. The process was tedious, requiring the team to disassemble the plane and have it flown out by a helicopter, piece by piece. For the next four years, it sat in a warehouse in Papua New Guinea amid controversy over who had the rights to sell the historic aircraft. The Swamp Ghost finally arrived in the US in 2010 and is now on display at the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum in Honolulu. Number 3. Red Army Tank 
In 2015, workers discovered an abandoned Red Army tank near the town of Seno in Belarus, known as KV-1, or Klement Voroshilov-1. The tank was named after a Soviet Union marshal and may date as far back as 1941, the same year that the Germans invaded the USSR. At the time, the KV-1 was the Soviet military's standard tank. Equipped with a heavy armored plate, it was extremely effective against most German anti-tank weapons. After sitting submerged in the swamp for over 70 years, the tank was removed by salvage crews. During the salvage, which was captured on video, they discovered that the tank turret was upside down and separated from the chassis, indicating that the vehicle was deliberately scuttled. It's unclear whether the vehicle was destroyed before or after it got stuck in the mud, and it also bore signs of possible fire damage. The historic machine may have been one of the 2,250 Red Army tanks that were used in the Battle of Senna during World War II. During the battle, the Soviets lost over 800 tanks, while the Germans lost around 300, which means that there may be more in the area still waiting to be found. Number 2. Museum of Soviet Vehicles Nestled in the Estonian countryside, about 90 minutes outside the capital city of Tallinn, is a large graveyard filled with hundreds of Cold War era machines. Known as the Museum of Soviet Vehicles, it contains cars, trucks, motorcycles, trams, buses, ambulances, police cars, diggers, and even some strange looking contraptions that aren't readily identifiable at first glance. Most of the collections date back to sometime between the 1950s and 80s. While the property is maintained and overseen, the vehicles are unrestored and the various states of decay. Many are rusting, while others are in surprisingly good condition for their age, with paint jobs that are still intact and only minor signs of deterioration. The site has more room for vehicles, according to career explorer Marek Braun, who wrote about his visit to the museum in his blog, Indie Traveler. As visitors enter, they can expect to trigger the emergency lights on the Soviet-era police car. This is meant to draw their attention to a donation box on the car's hood, where they can leave a small donation. Once the money is dropped in, the lights turn off, and the visitor is free to explore. Number 1. Heritage Park Wreck for many years, a small plane sat perched among tree branches at Heritage Park in Mission, British Columbia. Today, all that remains of the single-seater aircraft is a mangled metal mass consisting of what appears to be a cockpit and perhaps a wing. Very few people seem to know about the wreck, and even many locals are reportedly unaware of it. To add to the mystery, no one knows exactly when the plane crashed, just that it's been there since 1971 or earlier. The only reason anyone knows this is because a graffiti artist who left their mark on the aircraft took the time to attach the year to their work. There are reportedly no known records of the plane or the crash, and it's unknown whether the vehicle sits at the original crash site or if it was moved to its current location from somewhere else. In recent years, the wreck has fallen to the ground in several pieces, which can be found near trails that run through the park. The site is relatively easy to reach, but requires about 30 minutes of walking. Thanks for watching. Would you still visit the Bastness Car Cemetery if the notes the brothers left were real? Tell us in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe. See you next time. Bye.